Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event, Lessons from Afghanistan, hosted by the London School of Economics, School of Public Policy, the LSE Public Policy Review, and the Beverage 2.0 program. My name is Minou Shafiq, and I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I'm very pleased to be chairing this event today. I'm especially happy to be joined by my LSE colleagues, Dr. Michael Callan, Professor Mick Cox, Dr. Devika Hovel, and a special welcome to Nargis Nihan, who's joining us virtually uh, today at the LSE. This event marks the launch of the latest version of the LSE Public Policy Review special issue on Afghanistan, Long War, Forgotten Peace. The issue was published on the 2nd of May, and you can find a link to it in the Zoom chat or on the LSE Public Policy Review webpage. Mick will say a little bit more about this special issue and the brilliant lineup of authors which he has, which bring a range of perspectives to the current situation in Afghanistan. And Mick has obviously been the guest editor of that special issue and has played a key role in assembling these speakers and authors here with us. Obviously, the current situation in Afghanistan is tragic for its citizens who have suffered the costs of conflict now for many, many decades. And we will hear from the speakers about what that conflict has meant for the citizens of Afghanistan. The conflict also raises huge issues about the role of external interventions. Many of you will have heard the quote that Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. And many empires have learned bitter lessons from their attempts at interventions. I recall myself when I worked for the Department for International Development having endless arguments with colleagues in the military who kept calling for what they called quick impact projects. Let's do some quick projects and we'll persuade the citizens to support our cause. And those of us who would worked on international development for decades knew very well that quick impact doesn't mean anything. What, what really matters is long-term structural change, investments in development, and the internal dynamics of a society are far more important than the actions of external actors. And I think many of us have learned hard lessons about thinking long-term and the importance of strategic patience. But I'm sure we will discuss much of that during today's conversations. I should also just highlight that past issues of the journal have addressed important topics like international law, gender, international relations, and, and, and many other topics like populism, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemics, with articles by LSE authors across a wide range of disciplines. And I would encourage you to become a regular reader of the journal. So just before turning to the speakers, I would just mention that for those of you who are using Twitter, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE public policy. The event is being recorded and will be available afterwards subject to no technical difficulties. And after the speaker's presentations, each of which will be for about 10 minutes, I'll open the floor to questions and answers. And I'd encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function on the screens. So, uh, and also please do let us know your name and affiliation in your question. So let me turn now to our panel who bring incredible insight and experience to this issue. And in, in sequential order, we will hear first from Professor Mick Cox, who is Emeritus Professor of International Relations at LSE and one of the founding directors of LSE Ideas of which he was director between 2008 and 2019. After that, we'll hear from Dr. Devika Hovel, who's Associate Professor in Public International Law at the LSE School of Law. Following that, we'll have Dr. Michael Callan, who's Associate Professor of Economics at the Department of Economics at LSE, and as well as Research Program Director of the State Capabilities Program at LSE's International Growth Center. And then last but not least by any chance, we'll hear from Nargis Nihan, who's today's policy respondent. She's the former Afghan Minister for Mines, Petroleum and Industries, an activist and founder of Equality for Peace and Democracy. So with that in brief introduction, let me turn to Mick who will start us off. Well, thank you very much Manoush for that wonderful introduction. Uh, could I also say a great thanks to Irene Bukeli who has worked with me on the special issue without her 
I'm sure it would not have happened. So thanks to her. She did a great job. Also to Tim Besley, who's encouraged me all the way along the line. And also to, to give praise to this, uh, this wonderful series of London School of Economics Public Policy Reviews. I think it does a fantastic job in bringing the research uh, qualities of LSE and, and its friends and colleagues you know, to, to a much wider public. So thanks to all those people. And, and I should also point out that this is not only a, a special issue, it will also be coming out a, as a book uh, in the LSE press. So really pleased to see, see this. And I, I've been really privileged, really privileged actually, to be associated with a project dear to my heart uh, and a subject very dear to my heart. I'm gonna begin, however, Minouche, um, with the 24th of February of this year, it sounds strange, I know, uh, because that was the very day that uh, Putin decided uh, to invade Ukraine. In some senses, I think the 24th of February was a double tragedy. Firstly, a tragedy, as we have seen over the last two months for the peoples of Ukraine, uh, which has produced over five and a half million refugees, destruction on an unimaginable scale, and the destruction of lives, opportunities, and hopes. Now, why do I mention that? Not just because Afghanistan has suffered the same over many more years, but also it's about public attention. And I think what happened on the 24th of February is a tragedy in a second sense that has in some ways driven Afghanistan off the public agenda. It's put it on the back burner and it's pushed it off the radar screen. We don't see much on our front pages or our newspapers any longer. And I think this is a real, real worry. So that is why I call it a, a double tragedy, not only for Ukraine, but also the indirect and almost unintended consequences it has for the attention span of publics looking at, at Afghanistan and all the problems that it faces as well. What Afghanistan needs is more attention, not less right now. More concentration of effort, as I think you implied not less, and that is not what it's getting, it seems to me. This is also not a tragedy of recent origin. I mean, so much of the commentary almost seems to begin in August 2021, when NATO, or more precisely, President Biden, decided to withdraw Western forces from, from Afghanistan. And ha I, who of us amongst us here today can't remember those images, those desperate images, outside Kabul airport. And many of us at the time were doing our level best, our very best, as far as we could, to try and get people out, even using very direct contact with foreign office and friends on the ground. I hope we certainly succeeded, and to a degree we did. But nonetheless, those images conjured up all sorts of spectres of, of disasters past. Most obviously, I suppose, for me, going back some way, what happened in Vietnam in 19... 75, but who's, who can remember those images? And it was an image of collapse. It was an image of failure. It was an image of poor decision-making, bad decision-making. But Afghanistan and Afghanis are the people who are gonna live with that more than anybody else. Superpowers can move on, and as indeed they tend to, leaving behind them the detritus and the problems and the possibilities and the hopes, which I think have left behind behind in Afghanistan. But this is not a, even a crisis that began in August. It's not even a crisis that began on 9-11 uh, with the attacks on New York and the Pentagon. This is a tragedy, really, and I, I emphasize this in my own introduction, Minouche, that goes back to December 1979. And again, I'm low enough in the tooth to remember the very day on which it happened, watching those Soviet tanks rolling in to, to Afghanistan, wondering then, as I still wonder today about Putin's decision in Ukraine, what the hell are these people actually doing? Do they know what they're doing? And have any of them learned any of the lessons of history, the notion of Afghanistan as a, a graveyard of empires? So this is not just a short-term crisis. This is not even a crisis of the last 20 years. This is a 40 year crisis. This goes right back to, to the end of the Cold War. It then goes through the period of the Civil War, which the Afghan people had to leave. It goes through the period of the Taliban, the emergence of Al Qaeda, bin Laden. And of course, that in turn uh, 
globalize what went on in Afghanistan because of what then happened on 9-11. And then, of course, the United States and its allies, uh, NATO, uh, but the US in particular, made that crucial decision to intervene into Afghanistan. With, by the way, an interesting aspect to this for those who do IR, it was the first and I think the last time that NATO has ever invoked Article 5, which is that an attack on one is an attack on all. And the attack on the United States was immediately picked up in Brussels by, by members of NATO, that this wasn't just an attack on the US, it was an attack on the whole uh, Western uh, NATO alliance. The special issue, just to, to give it very, very, very brief summary here, is to analyze not just what, what went wrong, because it's easy to show that. It's easy to show that. Um, you know, what do they say? Failure is an orphan. <laughs> Success has many parents. And of course, at the moment, man, many are writing and understandably so about the failures. But I, 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 one, maybe this is maybe my generation, and maybe the hopes we had back in the early period of the intervention. And I knew many people involved at the time in Afghanistan doing their best uh, to build bridges, educate women, create schools, all the rest of it. I think we also need to remember some of the things that were achieved and, and, and some of the legacies that were left behind by, by Western intervention. I understand where the critics are coming from, but I think we need a balanced assessment. That's my own view, personal view, as to what happened. Um, and what the special issue tries to do, uh, Manoush, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring my comments to an end very quickly, is simply to try and analyze some of these real quick and ask the LSE question, the kind of the causes of things. What, if, if we start with the question, not, where, not what went right, but also what went wrong. And there's a number of explanations in this, and I'm sure Devika and Michael and Nargis and others will, will deal with this. I mean, the first, the first what went wrong kind of answer, and there are many answers to this question, or what, what, what could have been learned, I suppose it is, is provided by Sir Roderick Braithway in the first, in the first chapter. I'm not going to pick Roderick's uh, piece out uh, and privilege it against any of the others. It's just that Roderick is a rather remarkable British diplomat. He, he was the last British ambassador to the USSR. Um, he wrote a wonderful book on Afghanistan about the Soviet intervention. And his piece in the special issue, I think, points us in a certain direction. that Nobody seemed to learn any of the lessons of history. And uh, what might go wrong and what could go wrong may indeed have gone wrong. And I think it's a very wise piece by a, a very good friend of mine, and indeed somebody I think has made a great contribution to the understanding of the origins of this crisis going back, as I said, to the last 10 years of the Cold War. There's another explanation. I'll be interested to hear what our, our speakers have to say. Should the Taliban have been included in the, in the first government? This has been re remarked upon by any. I, Michael, I know, deals with the whole question of the three sins, as he calls them, the three sins of governance, and maybe that was one of the sins, Michael, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Could we have created a more inclusive government, which may have even had to include the Taliban or not? Did we try and do too much in Afghanistan? What turned, what started as a, what you might call a counter-terrorism exercise to defeat uh, AQ and, and turned into nation building a nation building today, of course, has a very bad press. Uh, but nonetheless, I, 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 as somebody who has a sympathy for policymakers, <laughs> having known so many over my life, you know, the dilemmas of what to do were huge, it seems to me. And I think understanding those dilemmas, you know, once you're in, as, as, as I think once was said by Secretary of State Colin Powell, once, once you get in, you own it. And once you own it, you've got to do something with it. And was that, however, too much too far? in the kind of society that Afghanistan was. You, you hear that argument. It's not something I, I always go along with, but I think it's an argument we need to take on board. And finally, of course, this comes up very much, I think, by critics of the Western intervention, of which there are, of course, several. We've said, basically, this was an a liberal illusion. You know, one other illiberal illusion, uh, the kind of attempt through the kind of international liberal agenda and that Afghanistan has fallen foul of that particular, you can't state build in certain kinds of society. That's a kind of an argument I feel very uncomfortable with. I, I have to be perfectly honest with you. 
maybe because I'm too much of a liberal these days. But there we go. But there are many, many explanations and many other ways of thinking about that. The question of international law is, is dealt with by Devika, and I really, in, really thought the chapter you wrote was actually wonderful on that. What lessons legally do we draw from Afghanistan or what lessons should we not draw? Finally, I'd just like to say once again, thank you to all the contributors for, I think, writing one wonderful, wonderful essays. We got essays on the United States, inevitably. We got essays on NATO, what NATO did by two great experts on NATO. We have, and of course, we have two chapters on, on, on women in, in Afghanistan. And we have, uh, we have a wonderful chapter too by a former LSE PhD. I'm bound to say that as well, Minush, uh, Dr. Feng Zhang, who did his PhD in IR, on, on China and its response to Afghanistan, a very balanced assessment uh, by Dr. Zhang on, on, on China's response to it. So with no further ado, I again, thank you for chairing this session this evening, Minush. I know you, this, is your, this is your ninth Zoom of the day. So thank you so much. It's, it's very wonderful for you to do that. Uh, and thank you to all, all the great writers in this. And I look forward to hearing what uh, the other speakers have to say. Thank, thank you, Nick. Thank you. Let's, let's hear from Devika. Thanks, Manoj. And I'd also like to thank Mick Cox and Irene Bocelli for the opportunity to think about these issues. Uh, I also want to note that I'm here on behalf of myself, but also my co-author, uh, Michelle Hughes. Um, and the opportunity to co-author with Michelle was a valuable one for me. I've long thought about these legal issues, but I'm a lawyer. Uh, who has never been to Afghanistan. Uh, Michelle is a former US Army intelligence officer and combat veteran who had a succession of deployments to Afghanistan where her role was to advise senior military commanders uh, in NATO on the rule of law and security sector reform. Uh, so with Michelle's help, we were able, I hope, to incorporate a, a, a deeper and more nuanced understanding uh, of the policies impacting the legal context. Uh, because as Mick has noted, uh, our paper uh, tries to understand the legal justifications for the use of force in Afghanistan and the way in which this has impacted international law relating to the use of force more broadly. So I teach international law and the use of force here at the LSE. And every year I begin uh, my master's course by asking for a show of hands as to whether students think the use of force is prohibited under international law. And I've also tried this trick when I give seminars to government lawyers. And across the board, more people raise their hands in favor of the proposition that states have a right to use force in international relations. We only have to look at the world around us. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Israel, the South Caucasus, Sudan, and as uh, Mick has mentioned, inevitably, Ukraine. So international relations is a geopolitical context littered with conflict and threatened conflict. So the important starting point then is to recognize that the legal position is exactly the opposite. The use of force is prohibited in international relations. And the prohibition of the use of force is in fact the cornerstone of the UN Charter framework. There are exceptions, uh, but these are limited to two exceptions, Security Council authorization and self-defense. So how then do we justify 20 years uh, of the use of force in Afghanistan? Our paper is entitled Self-Defense and its Dangerous Variants. Can you guess that I wrote this paper while I had COVID? Uh, our suggestion is that the events of 9-11, if you'll forgive the metaphor, yielded a number of variants in the interpretation of the doctrine of self-defense. And I use that mutation or disease uh, metaphor advisedly. Um, it's no exaggeration to say that international law relating to the use of force is now commonly divided between pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And given self-defense is one of two recognized exceptions to the prohibition of the use of force, the doctrine needs to be fairly capacious in order to accommodate or justify all those uses of force that we know are occurring and have occurred in the international community where it hasn't received Security Council authorization. So the boundaries of self-defense are constantly under threat. We have identified or sought to identify in our piece several shifts 
in the interpretation of the law relating to self-defense that find their foundations in the US response to 9-11 in Afghanistan. I won't deal with them all this evening and indeed I better hurry along in dealing with the ones that I want to mention tonight. So one variant we refer to, uh, we call the complicity variant. So complicity, by using that term complicity, this relates to the level of connection needed between the terrorist group and the targeted state. So in this context of Afghanistan, in the wake of attacks against New York and the Pentagon on 9-11, the idea that the US was entitled to use force in self-defense against Al-Qaeda uh, might seem to follow as a matter of legal logic. But the legal position isn't so simple. It's complicated by the fact that unless terrorists are located on the high seas or the moon, the use of force against terrorist groups in self-defense will necessarily implicate the use of force against the state in which they're located. So prior to 9-11, terrorist attacks did not necessarily justify a military response against the territory, let alone the toppling of the government of a state within whose borders members of the responsible terrorist group might be found. The rules set out by the International Court of Justice in 1986, this was in the Nicaragua case, was that in order for force to be justified, it was necessary to establish the fact that the target state had either sent the terrorists to attack or was substantially involved in doing so. So in the context of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, the test would provide that actually there was a need to establish that the Taliban had a substantial involvement in the 9-11 attacks, or even that they explicitly endorsed them. Of course, that wasn't the case. So we saw a shift in the legal test. As you may all be aware, uh, the justification given was that the Taliban was harboring or providing safe haven uh, to Al Qaeda. And this set the legal precedent altering the requirement to establish that substantial involvement with a terrorist group, transforming that instead into a more limited uh, association that of providing safe haven to terrorists. You can see the implication in terms of precedent. This essentially means that any state providing a safe haven to terrorists can now lawfully be the subject of attack conducted in self-defense or even regime change. This variant has given rise to an even more dangerous one if we consider it more broadly. And this is called the unwilling or unable variant. Now, nowhere has this been more obviously problematic than in Pakistan. The Bush administration's initial post 9-11 approach was to use military and economic incentives to convince Pakistan's then President Musharraf to withdraw official support to the Taliban and deny sanctuary to Al Qaeda. The diplomatic victory though was short lived. Pakistan continued to maintain an open door policy to fleeing Taliban, allowing them to evade American capture. And the net effect was that for successive US administrations, Pakistan's accommodation of the Taliban and Al Qaeda represented what they saw as an intractable security challenge. Some argued that the Taliban wouldn't exist today without Pakistan's support and bin Laden and Al Qaeda would not have been able to thrive without the safe haven it provided. The US in that context assessed that it had no choice but to pursue a more aggressive posture. In an August 2007 speech by then presidential candidate Barack Obama, Obama asserted that if we have actionable intelligence against bin Laden or other Al Qaeda officials and Pakistan is unwilling or unable to strike them, we should. Over the course of his administration, these words were put into action. Most famous example, of course, being the killing of Osama bin Laden by Navy SEAL Team 6. Uh, but the, the less publicized US directed drone strikes have been far more lethal and persistent. The exact numbers will likely never be disclosed, but one credible watchdog organization has estimated that between 2004 and 2020, there are at least 430 confirmed strikes on Pakistani territory, killing between 2,515 and 4,026 individuals, and that includes several hundred civilians. To take this into the slightly more arid legal terrain and considering that legal test, this provides quite a dangerous, again, precedent in terms of legal tests. So we remember that law of self-defense, it requires the establishment of an armed attack by a state before self-defense can be used against it. 
This changes the test to the idea that as long as a state is unwilling or unable to prevent threats, it can be attacked lawfully. So as articulated, this draws no distinction between the state that finds itself in the crosshairs because of its own double dealing, you might attribute to Pakistan, and even the earnest or unsuccessful state seeking to root out threats. As a legal matter, the unwilling or unable doctrine threatens to upend the principles of sovereignty that underpin the legal regulation of the use of force. Finally, I want to deal with the preemption variant. So as I've described, the Charter limits self-defence to responding to an armed attack. And prior to 9-11, it was accepted that this also enabled responses to imminent armed attacks. The cliche goes, the UN Charter is not supposed to be a suicide pact. It's highly questionable that this though can be used to justify 20 years of military intervention in Afghanistan. The suggestion would be that the US was constantly under imminent threat of attack. As international use of force scholar Christine Gray recognizes, the longer operation enduring uh, freedom uh, persisted, the further it was detached from its initial basis in self-defense. Yet self-defense remained the dominant justification on which the US relied. The US simply gradually took its interpretation still further in an innovation that has come to be known as the Bush Doctrine. So no longer was it necessary to establish the probability of an imminent attack. The Bush Doctrine, which we find initially in the US National Security Strategy of 2002, declared the need to adapt the concept of imminent threat to the capabilities and objectives of today's adversaries, maintaining the option of preemptive actions, even if uncertainty remains as to the time and place of the enemy's attack, a move from anticipatory self-defense to preemptive self-defense. Perceptions of the magnitude of the terrorist threat connected with an arc of post-Cold War optimism about state building. The dominant narrative then was that continued engagement by foreign and particularly US military forces in Afghanistan was made necessary by the need to ensure that the Taliban could never allow Afghanistan to become a terrorist safe haven again. But unfortunately, the, the rationalizing de democratization of Afghanistan in the name of US self-defense connects it with an outmoded Cold War narrative rather than any acceptable interpretation of international law. So over the course of a 20 year campaign, Operation Enduring Freedom clearly overstretched the boundaries and of even the broadest understanding of self-defense. In the direct aftermath of 9-11, legalistic objections to US action in Afghanistan could not help but sound reedy and off key. However, 20 years on, the world has been confronted, as Mick has said, by images of Afghanistan tumbling back under Taliban control, this time against the backdrop of a military operation that cost 175,000 um, military and civilian lives and more than 3.2 trillion US dollars. It might be thought at this point that international legal arguments come too late. Yet Operation Enduring Freedom and its successor, Operation Resolute Support, threatened to cast a long political and legal shadow. I want to borrow here from something another LSE alumni, Hilary Mantel, says about the plight of the historian. Like for historians, for international lawyers, hindsight is a necessary vice. And as Mick has highlighted, our discussion tonight takes place against the backdrop of outrage about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia's predominant argument is one of collective self-defense. And we see inevitably uh, some of these variants emerging in their interpretation. So some might snicker at claims of whataboutery where analogies are drawn. But the problem with playing fast and loose with these legal structures in order to achieve security goals in the short term is that they do set a precedent for similar action by all states in the long term. Thanks very much. Thank you, Devika, for reminding us of uh, that contemporary resonance of uh, elastic definitions of self-defense. Um, let's turn to Michael Callan now. Uh, so I first want to thank the organizers of the special issue. It's just wonderful to have these diverse perspectives on, on this issue. Um, and I also want to thank them for the occasion to kind of put pen to paper and actually collect my thoughts on what went wrong, um, along with my collaborator, Shaheem Kabuli, who worked in the office of the chief of staff of the president and is one of the people who were fortunate to get out uh, during the fall of the government last summer. 
Um, so I think I can offer a, a reasonably unique perspective. Um, I approached this Afghanistan sort of in my mid-20s. I'm now about 40, so I've spent most of my adult life sort of either working there in the field there, thinking about the issues there. Um, so it's very close to my heart as well. Um, I approached it without any sense of history. I approached it with very little expertise in international development. And I came in at a time right before the surge when the whole notion was that these quick impact projects that Manush had mentioned uh, were gonna somehow stem the tide or turn the tide. Um, I worked there throughout uh, one sort of, I guess, being a bit immodest for a moment. I think the real watershed for me uh, was developing a novel way of monitoring elections during the 2010 parliamentary elections that sort of leveraged information technology to do it at large scale and cost effectively. That opened the door to a whole bunch of experiments we ran over the years. After President Gandhi was elected in 2014, it was sort of the first opportunity for us to really embed directly in government and working close kind of at the cabinet level on a series of reforms, including reforms around how you account for who's working in the government and how they were paid. Um, so, you know, I guess an offer kind of that, that's where I'm coming from and that's how I approach it. Um, throughout that process, you know, you hear this, H.R. McMaster famously said that this wasn't a 20-year war, it was a one-year war that was fought 20 times, and, and that was very much my lived experience. It was one year we focus on reducing civilian casualties. The next year, it's corruption that's the issue. Um, and through that process, what I started to see, and this is really what I sort of argue about in the article, was that, you know, he was just spending a tremendous vast quantities of resources, much more than was spent to rebuild Europe after World War II, even in real terms, a tremendous amount of people, 175,000 people, mostly Afghans lost their lives. And it seemed like progress just wasn't coming. Um, and I think that I learned through the process was that I think of much, many of the issues that affected sort of the, the Afghanistan project really were there from the beginning and really were wo woven into the fabric of the constitution. Um, and that's what my article is about. And the reason I take this perspective is I really, if you take one thing away from my remarks at all, the most important thing is that I don't really think we can conclude from the failure of the, of the investments in Afghanistan, the project in Afghanistan, that democracy in an environment like that is impossible because we basically made some of the worst design choices conceivable at the very beginning. Um, and so these are the three objects that I call the three sins. Uh, the first mix had asked my perspective on whether the Taliban ought to be involved. Um, I think the answer is yes. I think if you look at the international record uh, where peace agreements are durable, the strongest predictive, predictor of whether or not a peace agreement endures is whether or not the insurgents are allowed to organize formally as a political party and participate in the subsequent political process. Uh, the fact that they had, you know, any time after 2004 onward, broad swaths of popular support among large sections of the Pashtuns and others meant that they were just a political reality. Uh, and I think sort of the you know, it really still is a very controversial idea to discuss the idea, you know, the, the notion that the Taliban ought to be represented in politics. Uh, well, now they have the whole thing anyway. Um, and so I think it should have been, been accommodated um, just based on sort of, you know, the international record alone. Uh, and also it was very clear that they were incredibly politically relevant uh, in Afghanistan, even when the U.S. sort of refused to acknowledge it. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that that reflected to me a really surprising unwillingness to be open-minded about certain matters for, among key policymakers. I, one thing that was very striking to me was a conversation I had early on with the people at Central Command who have planned the invasion in Orlando. And, and they, ex they explained this incredibly frenetic, sleepless process where they were all up long nights sitting at Central Command, thinking about various terrible scenarios that might attend the invasion, including insurgents getting a nuclear weapon or something like that. And, and nowhere in this, even for sort of hypothetical intellectual purposes, were they willing to consider just not invading or, you know, um, what, what it would happen if we, you know, invaded, but then reached a compromise very quickly. Um, so that was kind of the first point I make in the article is that, you know, I think that the failure to include the Taliban, you know, others, Ahmed Rashid have called this the original sin, and that's the language that I'm borrowing uh, for my article. Um, the second is that sort of the political institutions were really kind of created very hastily. Um, one artifact of that that's a little bit wonky, but I think quite relevant is that the electoral system is sort of uses a single non-transferable vote in these large multi-member districts. So it's sort of beyond the scope of this public discussion to get into the details, but this is well known to be like the worst electoral system you can imagine. It only exists in Vanuatu, in the Pitcairn Islands, 
Um, it happened briefly in Japan at the end of the Second World War, but the reason it's not used anywhere uh, is because it's known to be incredibly divisive. And, and something like that in an environment like Afghanistan, where people are otherwise just going to revert to tribal loyalties, it basically it totally eliminates the possibility for building coalitions around shared political agendas. It basically makes it impossible to have political parties be a reality in the country. Um, and so I call that the second sin. And that, again, is another decision that was made at the Constitutional Conference that basically made it impossible for the legislature to be relevant um, yeah, and to build political parties. Uh, and it also kind of vested most of the authority in, in the executive, um, which brings me to my third point, which is that the Constitution basically borrowed a bunch of Zahir Shah's constitution. It was incredibly centralized. Uh, so the president appointed all of the provincial governors, um, had you know authority, everything went through line ministries. There were sort of no features really of, of effective decentralization at all. And you know, different countries need different degrees, and you know, there's no one size fits all solution. But Afghanistan has incredibly decentralized de facto power. There are different people in different places who actually have armies, authority, control over trade. Uh, they play the role of settling disputes. Um, of you know, guaranteeing property rights, all the classic things we think of the state as doing was actually in effect being done by non-state actors in much of the country. Uh, and so that reality just needed to be reflected and absorbed um, in the constitution. Uh, and you know, I think so in the end, parachuting a set of institutions on from outside very quickly without kind of much careful deliberation about the underlying political realities and the fact that there was sort of no endogenous process of developing these institutions just meant that you were really going to be forced to work on issues that were only at the margin of what mattered, which, you know, kind of basic things like these quick impact projects and not really working on things at the core of what matters, like are the set of institutions fundamentally compatible with the underlying political realities of the country? If you build a house, a foundation without sort of any awareness of the underlying terrain, it's, it's not likely to stand. Um, and so, yeah, that's the core contention I make in the article. Um, I talk about a few other issues that really are idiosyncratic to Afghanistan. And so maybe it really is plagued. Um, Pakistan was very unlikely to accept a sort of strongly US supporting regime. That was very clear. Um, they view this as part of their conflict with India. You can't understand Afghanistan if you don't understand the conflict between Pakistan and India. Um, and you know it's very hard to imagine a viable solution without a solution between the issues between Pakistan and India. Um, another contention that's often made, and, and I don't know if this is true, but this is just what I've absorbed from being there and working with senior policymakers, um, was that the decision to invade Iraq basically drained the, the effort of all of the sort of the key human assets and many of the resources it needed at a key moment, which is actually right when the constitution was being promulgated. Um, and so maybe the decision to invade Iraq also sort of doomed the enterprise to failure. Hard to say, but that's certainly an argument that I, I hear made uh, very often. Um, so let me kind of quickly conclude. Uh, so first, again, if you take anything from this, I want you to take away that I don't think we can conclude from Afghanistan that this sort of thing cannot work because we sort of made some very terrible design decisions along the way. Um, and so I just don't think that there's a fundamental lesson there about this being the graveyard of the empires and there's just nothing that can work. Um, I, I just don't think we can determine that because the decisions were so poor. Uh, and the second thing, I suppose, I make two more points. The first is just to, you know, in some sense, we're not going to be able to close the book on Afghanistan. There is a huge humanitarian crisis going on there. All of us inevitably in various ways are going to continue to get drawn in. I know that I am. Um, and so, you know, when I thought I would never kind of be thinking about it anymore, that's not the case. It's going to remain relevant and we're going to have to keep thinking about it. So this is going to be an ongoing process. Um, and the final point I'd make is a very broad one, which is for those of us who think about economic development, who think of, you know, our overriding goal is to end poverty in the world, say. The world's poor are now concentrated in countries that look like Afghanistan, and that's going to be increasingly the case. And that's in two regards. First, the world's poor are predominantly in fragile and unstable countries. And second, and this is a much more recent development, they're also disproportionately concentrated in places that are not democratic, that don't have basic political and freedoms and human rights. Uh, and so if, you know, I think Afghanistan provides a very important case for people who want to think about how to end poverty more generally, uh, because sadly, this is where the world's poor are going to be increasingly concentrated. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you so much, Michael. Lots of, lots of uh, 
big issues and questions that you raise. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to Nargis uh, for her reflections on, uh, on, on what she's heard. Uh, thank you very much, Monish Shafi. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, thank LSE colleagues for um, arranging this special publication on Afghanistan. I really appreciate that because, as mentioned by Professor Markham, unfortunately, the attention is totally uh, getting away from Afghanistan with the Ukraine situation. So our, uh, we hope that our partner and allies, such as LSE, will continue to provide, help us and provide us with the platform so that we can raise awareness and try to at least key, remind the world about the situation in Afghanistan. I mean, there is a lot that I want to share, uh, but I will start with the two questions that uh, Professor uh, Michael, you have posed was that, could we have included Taliban uh, and what could have done? And did we do too much? So I'll try to uh, um, respond uh, trying to, uh, around these two questions. First of all, I think we did make a, a strategic mistake by not including Taliban, especially that there was interest from their side to get to the political settlement and just try to um, you know, get into normal life and uh, be part of the political uh, settlement in Afghanistan. It was a huge mistake that all of us made. And I think uh, the whole world, but especially Afghans are paying a very high price for that. Um, and beside that, what I see right now in Afghanistan, the Taliban are repeating the same mistake. So they have the opportunity to actually form an inclusive government, bring all the factions together and have a political uh, settlement for Afghanistan. And they can maintain a uh, majority of the power, but at least some of it has to be shared with others. They repeat the same mistake. I just don't get it that when it comes to Afghanistan, nobody learns from the lessons. <laughs> Uh, secondly, when you say that, uh, did we do too much? I think yes, in terms of uh, trying to do too much and expecting too high, uh, we did that. Um, we should have understood that Afghanistan was a country that was in conflict for uh, uh, more than uh, two decades, uh, 20 years back from now. And we didn't have any functioning government even during Soviet occupation. So the communities were very much self-reliant in terms of conflict prevention, conflict management, conflict resolution, delivery of services and, and trying to help each other. So they had their own a very like, organic grassroots uh, mechanisms in place and structures in place that they were using for helping themselves. Suddenly we had the government trying to do everything in the center and provinces and it was impossible to do everything. On one, one hand, people were not allowed to do things on themselves. On the other hand, the government that was claiming that it would, it's taking all responsibility for providing, providing services to the people, it was not able to provide the services for the people. On top of that, look at our army. We were always questioning. We were saying, I remember that all of us were saying that, look, Taliban are having perhaps like breath with sometimes with water. They're coming into the battlefield and they're fighting. Our armies were trained in a way that they would not fight in the battlefield and say that we don't have uh, a mineral water and we haven't received it. So the amount, like the, the, the structure that was put together, the budget, everything was so expensive that there was no way that Afghanistan would have been able to maintain that. And then secondly, why the, we would have had so much of international troops in Afghanistan, where actually right in the beginning, we saw that the local groups were fighting Taliban and they were beating Taliban. Wasn't it much more effective, costly, uh, and uh, to actually empower those people and focus more on strengthening uh, the army of Afghanistan rather than bringing so much of international troops that they came with the money, with everything, they raised expectation, they expanded everything, and then suddenly by their departure, they created such a vacuum that we just could not fill it. Same thing goes with our police. In terms of police and rule of law, they came with their, their own structure that they thought would fit Afghanistan. It was not responding to the realities and need of Afghanistan. And same thing goes in terms of our structures, a very highly centralized system put in a place, country like Afghanistan, which was so much decentralized, which was so independent of the government structure, suddenly you have a government that for every single thing, a district governor cannot get the approval from the provincial governor because he doesn't have any authority, cannot get the approval from the minister because he or she also doesn't have the authority. The request has to go all the way to the presidency to get it. So imagine that we were going from one extreme that the communities that they were totally independent of the government, making them so much dependent uh, uh, on the government. So that was something that all of all the time you're questioning that how are we going to maintain that? 
the over centralization of the government was was a huge mistake that actually happened in Afghanistan and peace process was a very good example Afghanistan has been a country that has been in conflict, but communities somehow have always managed to resolve most of conflicts themselves. Suddenly the peace process started and the ministry of the High Peace Council tried to cope everything from the communities and say that, okay, we are going to resolve your conflict at the community level. We are going to build peace. We are going to have political settlement at the country level. People, you don't do anything. So what happened that people were actually could not get the support to continue what they were doing. On the other hand, the government also failed to provide services to the people. Now coming to the political side of it, in terms of political, the international community, when they came to Afghanistan, they made it very clear who they will be working with. When it came to serious discussions about our future of Afghanistan, they were always engaging with warlords, with ethnic leaders, or with a small number of Afghan diaspora. Those that they were really invested in Afghanistan, they were serving their communities, they were not engaged, they were not part of any decision making. And then in terms of corruption, all the time you were going to the international platforms, they, everybody would be talking about high corruption in Afghanistan. Everywhere we are, every year we are going to have the Transparency International report uh, marking Afghanistan the second or uh, the third uh, uh, corrupt country uh, in the world. But then on top of that, there are so many incidents and cases that we talk to the international community and we say that, okay, these individuals are corrupt, these are the cases, these are the evidence, but then they decided to just close their eyes, not to do anything about it. So how are you going to fight corruption if you just you know, like go and take selfie with the most corrupt officials mm -hmm. and keep on posting it on your Twitter and on your Facebook and try to promote it? And then on top of that, in terms of democracy, imagine a country like mm -hmm. Afghanistan that was in conflict, that went through civil war, and we knew that there was so much fragmentation at the social fabric level, right? So we talk about democracy, we talk about election, but we don't make any investment trying to digitalize the election system of the country so that we can re reduce and minimize the chances of misuse and corruption. Every time I'm sure you saw that we had election and there was dispute after that, every time that happened, and we never learned from that. So what happened that every time it was not vote of the people that decided who was the winner, it was actually the youth that decided who was the winner. And then non-transferable vote that we had, and then the less amount of uh, uh, power that we put in the in the political parties and the constitution of Afghanistan made things much more worse because we had no accountability. Mm -hmm. Imagine our parliamentarians literally had no accountability to anybody because they were not coming from uh, their political parties; they were just candidates from in, uh, as individuals. In terms of regions. We know very well uh, that Afghanistan would never be in peace until we don't resolve issues of Afghanistan with Pakistan and as well as with Iran. But we, we did, could not get any support to be able to have honest discussion with the Pakistan, with the Iran, and to be able to resolve that issue. I still believe, today I was part of a discussion with a group of Afghan experts that we were discussing, okay, what is the way forward now? And my position was that, until we don't come up with a political settlement, with an agreement with Pakistan and as well as with Iran, there is no way that Afghanistan can see peace. So this is the reality. I think on top of working on Afghanistan in institutions, everything, we also have to focus on how do we build regional consensus so that they don't bring their fights in the, in Afgh in the, in the, in the land of Afghanistan and they don't fight it there. In case of international community, I think the best example was given by Professor Michael, we are a very unlucky nation. So when even when the world intervened nine, after 9-11 to Afghanistan to help us with the fighting terrorism and as well as helping us with the state building, right after they went and they uh, intervened also in Iraq. So literally the attention was divided by half at that time as well. And then this time what happened, that as soon as we at least like situation happened, and we were hoping that after a few months, we would be able to engage all our allies and try to find a solution for Afghanistan, the situation in Ukraine happened, and we see no interest on anybody's body side to host an event of Afghanistan, to have a discussion, and to discuss that what could be the way forward. Now, what is happening, my last point in case of Afghanistan right now, it's very clear that we are having a very clear fight in Afghanistan. You are having the people of Afghanistan that they stood for democracy, they stood for the freedom of speech, they stood for equality, and they stood for human rights. Being in conflict, being a conservative country, still we believe that that is the way forward for us. 
So that is the way that people have chosen. And then on top of that, you have Taliban that you see the war crime that they are committing and the level of atrocity that they're coming in, uh, committing in, inside Afghanistan. I'm just amazed that still the international community is hoping that you will have a, Taliban will form an inclusive government and then they are going to like bring on board other ethnicities. They are going to provide services for the people. I mean, for God's sake. Or our educated Afghans could not do it. How do you expect that from the Taliban to do it? So I think for us, working on Plan B for Afghanistan is really important. What is happening in Afghanistan today will not remain in Afghanistan. It is soon going to have its spillover in Pakistan. We already see the result of that. The Tehrik Taliban of Pakistan, they have already claiming that they, are, they have started intensifying their attacks on the army of Pakistan. It's going to expand to other countries as well. And the fight is very clear. The fight is between extremism and modernism that has started in Afghanistan in several other countries, and it's going to get expanded. Now we have to wisely choose which side we are taking. If we want to go for democracy, freedom of speech, sustainable peace, equality, all those values that we talk about it, and we know that we need them for an equal and just society. If we choose that side, it's going to be a very bumpy and a very hard path ahead of us. But then you're having very educated uh, 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 generation of Afghanistan, the warlords are expired, please don't bring them back. The ethnical leaders are gone, please don't bring back. Bring them back. Once Taliban are gone, let them go. But then let's try to find from every ethnicity, the emerging leaders, try to engage with them and make sure that they are going to be part of the solution. But it's also very important that we make sure that we come up with a political order that would respond to the reality of Afghanistan. We come with a structure that people will be accountable to the people, not to the international community. We also make sure that we come up with a program that actually we serve to the people and then make sure that we move forward. For us, independency, economic development is more important than anything. And I think we have enough human capacity, although most of us are evacuated, but all of us are willing to go back to Afghanistan and take part in the construction of Afghanistan. Whatever we do with Afghanistan after this will set the example and the precedent for all other countries that they are in conflict. And you have groups like Taliban that they are trying to over the state. But if we give in to the Taliban and decide and just select go ahead as they are and try to close our eyes and think that, okay, like fine, whatever is happening in Afghanistan and it will remain in Afghanistan, First, it will not remain in Afghanistan. Second, it will it inspire many other groups in other countries that they can come, they can take the whole government as a hostage, and then after that, they can demand anything from the international community, and the international community will, will, uh, will accept that. So we have that. I really hope that our allies will get the time, come together, and help us with the development of that strategy. Uh, I thank you very much, and I stop it here. Um, and I'm, off, I'm, uh, I'm here for more questions. I do have some other points, but I'm hoping that in between questions, I'll be able to also bring them up. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nargis, for those, for those wonderful insights and perspectives. Let me, I've got some questions coming in from the audience. Thank you very much. Keep those coming. I wanted to just start with a, with a broad question to all of you. I think the most, one theme that emerged from all of your remarks was, um, we never learn lessons about whether it's about previous invasions in Afghanistan or other parts of the world, the abuse of international law and the dangers of, 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 of doing so, how peace processes are successful and how they have to be inclusive, uh, you know, voting systems, decentralization, all of those things are things we know and have heard from other conflicts and throughout history. This is a really hard question for me to start with for all of you. There are other, there, but I just felt I had to ask you why, why is it that we don't learn these lessons? What is it in our political systems, in our psyche, in our that, that these lessons don't get learned? I don't know who wants to start. Well, let me let me just maybe have a, a shot at that impossible question if I could, uh, Nanoush. Uh, I, I think actually policymakers often do learn lessons. Sadly, they often learn the wrong lessons. Uh, I mean, so, you know, learning the lessons of history is, is a problematic proposition insofar as it depends which lessons you really want to draw. I, there was a lesson drawn during the Cold War about Nazi Germany, 
And it ended up really extending the Cold War because everybody thought the Soviet Union then in the 50s and 60s was like Nazi Germany, which I don't think it was. Enough, but they drew the lesson that you should never engage. Anyway, I don't want to get into that, but <clears throat> there is a problem. There is a huge problem because we think every situation is unique, although we think comparatively. But the one lesson I think, and I come back to what Michael said and, and Nargis as well, and because the one lesson that was not drawn at the very beginning, and maybe it was impossible at the time for Americans to draw it because of what had happened on the day of 9-11 and the shock that this induced. The idea, to quote Mrs. Thatcher, of talking to terrorists. Mm. I lived in Northern Ireland for over 22, very happy years actually, from troubles to peace. And it was pretty obvious from a very, very early on, at least by the 1980s, that unless you could draw the provisional IRA through their political wing, Sinn Féin, into the political process, and here I do think is an interesting parallel, Michael and Nargis, unless you could draw them in, make them part of the solution and not part of the problem, there wouldn't be a peace. And it took eight, nine, ten years of delicate negotiations and compromises and ambiguities and all sorts of other things. But that's what made the Good Friday Agreement possible. Now, was anybody thinking of the Good Friday Agreement in Washington or in, on, in 2001? I, I, I suspect not. In, in a way, I think maybe that was the original sin, I think, as Michael has pointed out, because in the end, you did end up in an imperfect peace, but a peace nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of that, there, were, there was development. There's not been reconciliation between the two communities. I can attest to that. People still go to different schools and all the rest of it, yet you have you cobbled together a peace. But that meant drawing those who were the problem into the peace process. Mrs. Thatcher would never have done it. Tony Blair, God bless his cotton socks, did do it. And there were reasons why he needed to do it. And he had the people around him to do it. That wasn't a lesson drawn. It's interesting to know why that lesson was never drawn in Afghanistan. Perhaps Northern Ireland seemed too parochial, too far away from those situations. Those are my just broad reflections, uh, Manoush. Thank you, thank you, Mick. Any others want to make a comment before I turn to audience questions? Uh, no, I guess. Um, to build up on what uh, Professor Michael have said, as uh, someone that I was on the ground and we were always raising these issues with the policymakers, international communities, everybody, where all the time they were nodding as they knew exactly what was the problem, but they kept on repeating what they were doing, continuing. My personal impression is that, first of all, there is a lack of political will. Mm -hmm. And I see that as a side effect of democracy. You're having election every five years, and with the technology and connectivity, everybody wants to show that they can change the whole nation in five years. So of mm -hmm. course, for the US, for the European countries, always Afghanistan case was part of their foreign policy, yeah? So then they were discussing the candidates that what is their solution for Afghanistan? That was problem number one, because like, why would you bring a sensitive case like Afghanistan in your campaigns? It, should ha it shouldn't have been part of political campaign. And then there was that, that created Afghanistan fatigue, thanks to international media, constantly reflecting the uh, negative news to have more viewers, not focusing on the progress that you're making in Afghanistan. So that actually diminished and decreased the political will because everybody thought that, okay, it's a, such a long-term process. There is no way that we can benefit anything in short term in Afghanistan. Let's focus more on withdrawal because that brings us more support and vote rather than staying there and trying to make the case that we have to continue in our engagement with Afghanistan. And secondly, lack of accountability. I mean, in case of use, you're talking about self-defense. And then they are very irresponsible withdrawal. And the situation that we have right now in Afghanistan, US is definitely with all partners responsible for that. But who is going to hold them account? And then secondly, the president ran away with all his team and put the country in the whole chaos. Where is the accountability? We don't even, we don't even have the mechanisms to actually put these people in like into a trial and have the accountability so that others could learn that, okay, if I make a mistake today, I am going to be held accountable uh, uh, later on for it. Uh, 
let me turn to uh, Devika. Did you want to come in or? Well, very, very briefly, and I do so reluctantly, because this is more, far more about politics and policy than law. Uh, but it's just that tendency to dis dismiss international law as a marginal enterprise that happens always uh, in times of crisis. Uh, and so in terms of lessons of history, I mean, what international law seeks to do is embed a very minimal set of rules that are lessons from history. They come from state practice that's developed. And the tendency is always to say, no, but this is a new threat. This is something entirely different. Uh, we need new law. Um, you know, and, and the other quick point I want to make is, is related to that speaking to the rogues, bringing them into the conversation. We see once again the idea that we should cast Russia out of the UN, uh, just as we should not include the Taliban. Uh, and building in, as international law does seek to do that, equality between states and the need to engage actually uh, with both uh, the legitimate and illegitimate in the eyes of the West uh, equally is, is important. Thank you very much. Let me turn to the first audience question from Andrew Lone who asks, many mistakes were made in Afghanistan and Iraq and more historically Vietnam. Does the US retain the capacity to do something similar again? What will stop it making similar mistakes? Uh, are there any good examples of US overseas intervention to emulate instead of errors to avoid? Maybe I'll start with Mick, since he's smiling. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks, Manish. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, the, look, the United States has done a lot of good things in the world. Come on, we've got to be get the balance right. The, the Marshall Plan was pretty good after World War II. Um, international aid, the construction of the Bretton Woods system, it, contains some flaws, but nonetheless, that was a pretty good US intervention. Uh, I actually think when the United States has talked, you know, at least genuinely about human rights and democracy promotion, let's just take it at face value, not just see it as a cynical ploy to hide American power, though I never ignore American power. I think the real, the real issue today, however, is not to castigate or to idealize the United States. I think that those are two poles in the debate I think we genuinely need to avoid. And that's, I frankly think, why so much of the debate about the United States has never been that good, frankly. I think the real issue today is, and, and we see this over Ukraine. I mean, in a sense, Afghanistan withdrawal, if I can put it like this, Mnuchin, what we have seen with President Biden over uh, over Ukraine almost seems to me to point to the two sides, the two, the two, the two sides of the American coin. You know, one getting out rather hastily, and 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 I think too hastily. Uh, although I can understand the reasoning why, and therefore America is retreating or withdrawing. And let's be perfectly honest, that decision was supported by a, an overwhelming majority of Americans. You can't make a decent foreign policy if you've not got the Americans behind you. You know, all foreign policy is domestic politics in America, and that's still very, very important. It's not just America can act alone. On the other hand, I mean, with, again, without idealizing what, what the US is doing or not doing, and I know there'll be others who take a different viewpoint to me, it does seem to me that it's started to lead over the whole question of, of, of Ukraine and Russia. I, I, I agree with Javika, you know, we don't, want to leave, we don't want to leave states as big as Russia out in the cold forever. I agree with that. No doubt about that. On the other hand, I, I kind of see the United States, without the United States, I can't see how any degree of strong resistance to, to Russia's aggression would have taken place. But in the end, much of this is gonna depend on domestic politics in the United States. And we all know the same story, Manoush. American domestic politics is broken. You know, the divisions, we've seen this just recently over the Roe versus Wade. Half of the country, more than half the country, opposed to it, but, you know, 40% of Americans, it seems, supporting it. You know, look at every single issue in America today, it divides Americans by class, by ethnicity, right along the line. And I think that is really the biggest problem, thinking about America. You know, America's the superpower we don't like, but America's, it's the only superpower we've got. Uh, and until somebody can come up with some alternative, perhaps we don't need a world of superpowers, and maybe that's but I'm not so sure. I've been studying IR for far too long to come to that conclusion, I suppose. Okay, let me turn to a question from Ewan Grant uh, from London, who asks, 
and I think I'm going to give this one maybe to Michael uh, to mm -hmm. start, which is, are there any signs that Western disputes with Pakistan are inhibiting humanitarian and economic support to Afghanistan? Well, that's a, it's a challenging one. I mean, so, I, you know, I, I think it, it does make it very, very hard for the U.S. to intervene uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I think that, you know, the initial deal that they tried to, to, strike, to strike after 2001 was that Pakistan would remove its support for the Taliban and in return we would kind of provide large scale aid support. Uh, the anecdote is, is that when that decision was made, sort of half of the military establishment in Pakistan promptly resigned because they see <laughs> Afghanistan as a key part of their global military strategy. Um, I think the reality that, you know, whether or not we like it, the military has tremendous sway in Pakistan and is ultimately sort of the arbiter of kind of who runs the country and, and basically the, the most powerful sort of policy force um, means that sort of anything in that sphere is going to be determined by their interests. So it does make it very hard for us to kind of intervene in a way that's purely humanitarian, um, just because it has to also be aligned with what the Pakistani military brass would like. Um, as much as I enjoy working in Pakistan and, you know, can, would like to continue to. Okay. All right. Here's um, a question from Harshita Thakral, an LSC alumni in law from Jaipur. Uh, do you think the West could station the Air Force for longer? Would that have been sustainable to maintain some presence for longer in the U.S.? Who would like to take that? I can take part of it. Um, some of this is it really does come down to very basic logistics. Um, I think the, the nature of the withdrawal and the fact that it was so chaotic really came down to the fact that the army had been constructed around a model of being supplied by air and it couldn't be supplied by land. Uh, and so when you close down Bagram, you kind of you shut down the beating heart of the, of the of the whole operation and you do that initially it becomes there's no reason that the troops that are in the field would continue to fight they're not going to be supplied um now would it be politically sustainable to keep the american intervention going on i don't think so i think as mick pointed out perfectly i think the american people were thoroughly fatigued and wanted it to end and weren't even that disheartened that it ended so poorly um, but I do think these very, you know, the deeply disappointing and disheartening thing of the nature of the withdrawal to me was just that the very basic logistics of kind of getting people who deserve to get out, out, kind of sequencing things appropriately wasn't done carefully. Um, and I think that that's a, a, you know, another vital and important lesson that we should take from this. And I think there also should be some accountability there, as much as I hate to say it. This one is for Nargis. Uh, it's from Laura Hein, who's an LLM uh, from Germany at the LSE. And she's asking about women's rights. And she says, can current claims from the international community of making financial aid conditional on women's education, participation, and so on have genuine impact? Or is it rather rhetorical along the lines of the justification of the intervention in Afghanistan in 2001 to liberate Afghan women? In a, way, in a way that the Taliban can use women's rights to get financial resources for international recognition? I mean, all of us were hoping that um, while Taliban cease fire in Afghanistan, at least there will be some changes in their policy with regards to dealing with women's rights. They would at least uh, allow women to go to work and they would allow uh, girls to go to school. But then, of course, there will be more restriction because the environment is going to be more restrictive and uh, there will be more uh, implement, uh, uh, implementation uh, uh, um, uh, of Sharia law. But none of us predicted that they will uh, uh, ban girls from going to secondary school. They are going to come with so many restrictions on women in terms of their movement, freedom, everything. Uh, so in terms of women's movement, um, the international community's uh, position by, for not recognizing Tal Taliban and uh, conditioning all their support to Afghanistan uh, at least uh, have created uh, enough not only pressure on the Taliban, but also more of uh, in like encouragement and spread for Afghan women that, okay, we have our allies and there are more pressure on the Taliban. So it's not that we have to fight all the battle and we have to do everything. Yes, we have to take the risk. We have to fight the battle in terms of in like struggling for our rights, but we also have our, our allies that they can also put the pressure on the Taliban uh, uh, for trying to grant our rights. 
Now, whether that is going to result into anything in terms of changes of the policies within Taliban, that is something which I, uh, I genuinely doubt because Taliban are fragmented and they are already divided in three groups and, uh, uh, and, uh, and functions within themselves. So you have one group that they do want to continue and they want to allow girls to go to school and they want to bring those policy because they are very interested to engage with the international community, receive the money and continue their go governance. But then you also have very brutal Taliban that on the hardliners that they are not interested in the money, they don't care about the money, they want to continue with all these bans and they are mostly counting on you know, like their support from other groups rather than the international community. And they are not so much interested in politics, governance, building up of the system and maintaining of these things. So women's movement and women's rights, unfortunately, have become highly political. And with the current changes that I see with the Taliban, at least as someone that I'm closely working with women, I don't think that we can expect more than what Taliban are doing right now. Um, except, except that what I see that I explained to someone today in the morning as well, the changes that I see on the ground, the Taliban came with the plan that they will have put a lot of restrictions, not only on women, but also on the minority, civil society, everybody. What I see happening is right now that because of the multiple attacks that we have, especially on the Hazara community, because of the uh, intensify of the attacks that we have from the ISS, because of the pockets of resistance that we have, which are taking shape and form in different parts of the country, because of the women's uprising that we have, the starvation, the poverty that we have, and uh, the anger of the people, literally, slowly and gradually, we see that things are getting totally out of control of Taliban. So for example, they have stopped going after angels, trying to intervene in their activities the way that they were doing it, few months back trying to go after women because now they have a lot in terms of problem on their plate to deal with. Interesting. Mm -hmm. so this one I think is for Devika. It's from Anthony, who's an LSE alumnum, who asks, who is the arbiter of self-defense under the UN Charter? Presumably the ICJ in The Hague. Have they ruled on the Bush administration's attempts to stretch self-defense to include an attack, maybe possibly sometime in the future, and others outlined by your important presentation? If not, then presumably it is not law yet. Thank you. What a great question. So it's it's there's a usual tendency on the part of lawyers to think, well, international law, it must be determined by courts. It's not the case. Certainly the ICJ can hear such a claim, but it relies on states referring it to the court. And that very rarely happens in, in terms of use of force. It just reminds me very briefly of an intervention between Jack Straw and Michael Wood, the legal officer, uh, at the, the legal advisor at the Foreign Office in the context of Iraq. And Jack Straw <laughs> said exactly that. Look, you may have advised me that the use of force uh, in Iraq will be unlawful, but there aren't any courts in international law. And therefore, it's really up to me to interpret it uh, because there's no court that can tell me if I'm right and wrong and things are pretty uncertain. In the course of the Chilcot inquiry, Michael Wood made, it, made a really in interesting intervention. And he said, no, what Jack Straw said in that memo uh, is actually it should be the opposite. Because there are no courts, States are the interpreters of international law, and therefore they have an even stronger duty then not to distort in the way that if we were arguing before a court as, a, as a, um, one of the parties, we can propose interpretations, ultimately then it's the court that rules. In international law, it's states that dictate what international law is, and so all states and particularly the great powers have a responsibility not to abuse uh, or distort it. That's a far cry from reality at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but good to be reminded that that's the principle. Um, let me turn to a question from Annika, who's an undergraduate at LSE. Um, and I'm not sure, I think I'm going to give this one to Nick, if that's all right. How would you suggest we move away from policy and intervention systems that are often rooted in preserving existing power structures and Western-led definitions of peace and justice? Well, good question. Can't answer. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 could I recast the question as a, a bit like a politician? I'm becoming terrible at this minute. I would put it rather differently and not just move it to about what we mean by the West or the Western community. 
But let's go back to a very old fashioned notion, which has now almost disappeared, the notion of an international community. Um, and I go back 30 years just after the end of the Cold War, or maybe even you know, to the latter part of the 1990s, which were, were moments of great hope. Uh, and a notion that, you know, and George Bush Sr. talked of a new world order. Now, one could be cynical about that, but what he really meant, if I could be fair to George Bush Sr., who, who wasn't a bad US president by, by any stretch, I think, he kind of meant that if we could get all the P5 members together, the great powers, if you like, which included Russia and China, only if and when we can bring the, all five together are we going to get any kind of approximation to a solution to some of the great problems facing the world today. Now, and at the time, of course, he was talking in the context of the first Iraq war back in 1990-1991. But if you can generalize and take that beyond the, the context of the time into a wider context, that, I think, is the real way forward. Tragically, we are as far away from that now today, Manoush, building on your last point there, uh, uh, than ever. We, we now see Russia and China, and I'm not going to get into the rights and wrongs of any of this, but in, in structural and real political terms, we see Russia and China, in a sense, forming it almost, in, in a sense, their own bloc uh, on one side with a different vision of world order, maybe a better vision. I'll, I'll leave that up for others to decide. Um, and then on the other side, you, if you like, you've got what we would broadly and ambiguously sometimes call the West. Um, and, and what this war in Ukraine has revealed, as much as the Afghan war revealed, is the deep divide. And, and in a way, it's not just down to what we call the Western community, it's down to the international community. Yet, with that community now so deeply divided over visions of the future, that, who runs the system, who organizes it around what principles, you know, we're in a very, very, very problematic position. And I'm only saying the opposite. So that's not really a direct answer to it, but it's actually moving the debate away from kind of casting all responsibility on the West, and they have responsibility, to the responsibilities that other important powers in the world have in a multipolar world. Mm. You know, it's not just the West, it's not just the Americans or the EU, it is also Russia, it is also China. You know, it is also Turkey, it is also the emerging powers of Southeast Asia, Japan, all of these also have a responsibility. And until we arrive and get to a situation, which I'm at the moment we're miles away from, where we can get all back to the original vision of the of the of the UN, that one which was recast in, in his own way, of course, by, by Bush in 1990. I think we are going to continue with all the problems. And this, of course, comes out over Afghanistan as much as it comes out over Ukraine. Thank you, Nick. Maybe I'll just ask for a final reflection from each of the panelists. And I'll just ask you to look forward now, because we've, we've, we've mainly been trying to learn lessons mm. from, from the mm. recent experience in Afghanistan. And if you had to look forward, could you say something about the prospects for Afghanistan, per se, and how you see the next let's say five years, uh, or say something about what the lessons of Afghanistan mean for the prospects of views about intervention in other countries' affairs and what the, what the lessons are, what, what, yeah, how you think that will shape future action uh, in, in around intervention. So who would like to go first? <laughs> you can do either or both, whichever you, Debbie. Never can. <laughs> Only because I think will get me out of the way. I, I'd love to hear from the policy um, <laughs> experts <you> <laughs> and those who understand. I uh, took so very, very quickly. I just all those comments uh, from the questions left me. And I know you asked me to look forward, Manoush, but I'm getting old. And so nostalgia is part of my looking <laughs> forward. And it's this sort of nostalgia for the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> um, that strange constellation of power where we're actually, uh, as Mick had said, you know, having one superpower is a very unstable setting. Uh, and that setting where we were forced to have that balance of power, uh, a bit of Spider-Man for you. I mean, with that great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's, that's what you were saying in a more professional way, Mick, um, than the Spider-Man quote. But, you know, that acknowledgement that actually together with that response that that exercises of power you know 
a balance of power being a really important aspect of that. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Who'd like to go next? I'll, I'd be happy to go next. I think I should leave Nargis for the end since she's the real expert here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you know, I, so I'll start off being fairly cynical and then hopefully be able to strike some notes of optimism. But, you know, the one thing I've learned in all these years in Afghanistan is if you want to ruin a dinner party, you start talking about Afghanistan because the conversation <laughs> never ends well. Um, and right now I actually feel pretty genuinely cynical about the prospects there. I think it's a country that's facing a tremendous humanitarian crisis. The World Food Program is on the ground there. If you, their numbers are, are to be believed, it, it is in the midst of a, of a full-blown humanitarian crisis. And the unfortunate and sad politics of the situation are basically, you know, no one wants to be seen to be the person who is legitimizing a regime that's hostile to human rights, that's channeling resources to, you know, to a fundamentally hostile regime weighing that against basically can we let this humanitarian crisis reach levels that become unacceptable so i think it creates a real urgent need for us to think of models of intervention where we can you know provide critical humanitarian assistance even when the regime is very hostile because i think if you think of you know afghanistan surely is not the only place in the world where this is the case uh, and sadly as i said in rem my remarks i think this is actually going to only become a more frequent and not less frequent phenomenon um, so let me try to do the impossible, which is end a discussion of Afghanistan on an optimistic note. Um, so I think that there is a lot that came out, at least, you know, in, in my discipline from the exercise there. I think that, you know, it was, we know way more about how insurgency works. We know may, way more about the role of governance in building inclusive and sustainable solutions. Uh, we have much more sort of empirical research on conflict and how to address it, what works and what doesn't work than we did 20 years ago. And if you kind of teach a course on these topics, the vast majority of, of, of papers that are relevant at the current time will have been written in the last 20 years. Um, so I think, you know, at the minimum, there's a, you know, we need to think about places like Afghanistan, as I said in my comments, I think that this is where the world's poor are going to be concentrated. Uh, but I, you know, I think that there's a generation of researchers that are rising to that challenge and, you know, hopefully we can start to feed this into policy. Um, but yeah, anyway, that, those are my thoughts. Great. And things like this journal issue are a good example of doing exactly that. Exactly. <laughs> Michael, and then I'll give Nargis the last word. Yeah, well, again, terrific question. Um, uh, let me inject some uh, hope and idealism, uh, and maybe going back, possibly not to the Cold War, Devika, <laughs> which I wrote far too much. Uh, but yeah, I, I get your point. You know, it looked like a relatively stable period. Although, by the way, remember the 25 million people on the periphery, so-called, died in third world conflicts caused by and exacerbated by the Cold War, Vietnam, Korea, and Afghanistan, by the way, in the last 10 years. So I, I want to be a little bit cautious about the Cold War, but I, I get your point. I get your point. You know, a one power international system is inherently unstable. Uh, and, you know, the real politique you suggest may, may take us back there. Who knows? Perhaps a balance of power ultimately between the United States and China. China is a responsible stakeholder, to use that old fashioned phrase coined by Bob Zelik many years ago. Maybe that is the way in which we get two great powers together who have share at least more shared interest in things that divide them. And then maybe that is the, that is the way forward. Devika. It won't be Russia, of course, in this. But I also want to go back and be a bit idealistic, maybe less to the Cold War, more to that moment just before the Cold War when the UN was created back in 45. As an old cynical realist, I've become more and more attached to the old UN in a sense I've become more and more attached to the old League of Nations going back to 1919 and 1920. And I think responsible intellectual policymakers have to provide some kind of vision for, for peoples out there. They need, they need vision. They need hope. And we do have examples through the old league, whatever its failings, through the original conception of the UN, whatever its uh, compromises that were made at the beginning with the great powers. And unless we go back to that, I think we are going to be in constant trouble because every single issue in the world today, for, whether it's Ukraine, divides, whether it's Afghanistan, divides, whether it's Yemen, it divides, you know, whether it's the South China Seas, it divides. You know, and look at the look at where the UN is at the moment. It's in a terrible state, it seems to me. I mean, it does very, very good work, but not not, not within the central body. So I suppose I, I hold forth that 
kind of idealized, that idealized world that was the great hope of humanity, the great parliament of man. And until we, I think, return to that, I think we are going to continue to be seeing the tragedies we are witnessing in Ukraine. And of course, the tragedies we are continuing to see as Nargis has put so eloquently and well in, in Afghanistan. Nargis, over to you. Um, well, once again, two reflections based on the situation that I was experiencing in Afghanistan. Uh, first of all, uh, you are concerned about um, the world being dependent on one superpower and uh, like that pretty much is not sustainable. Actually, we saw in Afghanistan a totally in a different scenario. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that the structure of United Nations is there and the structure was very clear that US was very much influential in that. And that's why UN was also more relevant and influential because they always had the backing and support of the, Amer the United States. And it was somehow, if not respected, at least others were trying to collaborate and cooperate with UN. Now what we see in the last 20 years in Afghanistan that Pakistan is becoming more independent. China is becoming is emerging as another superpower, and uh, um, uh, Iran is, is is trying to uh, claim their uh, like independency and uh, claiming their own space in our region. And same thing goes with India. So now the question that we kept on asking ourselves in Afghanistan that how are we going to balance all balance all their competing interests in Afghanistan? It's impossible. And then the other problem that you're facing that there was a time that there was uh, the, the the United States and, and, and allies to the UN was putting sanctions on them, was holding to account, and at least it was making a difference. But now it's not. So don't be very shocked if. Tomorrow, Pakistan would attack and get some province of Afghanistan officially the way that Russia did it. Because now they don't care about the UN structure anymore. So we really have to look at the UN structure and see how we can make it more relevant where people feel that like, they will be held to account for that and they have to respect that charter. Because at least in case of Afghanistan, we saw that they're not doing it. Same thing goes with China. On one hand, they are interested in all economic activities in Afghanistan and other countries. But when it comes to the security and humanitarian crisis, they take no responsibility. So I think like, that's what we saw the emerging superpowers, that they are much more irresponsible and they are interested to use countries like Afghanistan for their strategic debt, for their benefit. But then they have no interest of helping those countries to come and for their solution and help them with their, with their solution. That's in case of uh, uh, international engagement and emerging superpowers that we are very much concerned, especially in, in our country, the region, the part of region that we live. In case of Afghanistan, uh, I mean, coming five years, what I see that, unfortunately, I don't see the openness from anybody's side to help Afghans to come to a political solution. What I see is that we cannot speak about women's rights, human rights, inclusive government, any of these things, until we don't come up with a political solution for Afghanistan. Even if we convince Taliban that, okay, form a, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, an inclusive government, can you really prevent the resistance, which is right now taking shape and form in different parts of Afghanistan against the Taliban? No, people have a lot of grievances against the Taliban. So, and the Taliban with the way that they're treating people, they're creating more enemies and they're creating literally on a daily basis more grievances against them. So we need a political solution that all Afghans come together. I really hope that this time we, the Afghans, work on that solution. We have to sit amongst ourselves. We have to decide how do we share power, what kind of political order we'll have in place, which will be respected by everybody, and we're not going to challenge it. But what we need the world to help us out First, to provide us with the space so that we can continue to have this conversation. For example, they helped the Taliban by helping them to have an office in Qatar in 2012 so that you know, they, can, they have an address and they can get into political discussion. But right now, our political groups and civil society have no space to have and no support to have these kind of discussions. It has been now eight, uh, eight months that you know, we are all in exile out of Afghanistan. And then on top of that, in terms of supporting what we need the world the most to provide us the space to have to come up with those solutions and we will help them not to once again bring back those irresponsible leaders warlords craft officials and others and try to make them once again relevant on us 
Thirdly, we help them to build regional consensus so that at least there is a consensus that they're not going to bring their fights into Afghanistan. And then once we, give, we produce that political solution, help us with the implementation of that. But we have to have a mechanism for accountability. And that accountability should be at the Afghans level and it should be people should be the forefront of that, not the international community. Very good point. Very well said. Thank you very much. Um, one of the role of universities is to um, is to learn these lessons and document them. And uh, I think the panelists and the authors of all of the papers in the in the journal are doing precisely that. And the other thing that universities can do is they can take the long view. Thankfully, we're not all elected every four or five years. <laughs> And, and we can afford to think longer term and to hold on to those lessons. And so thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all of those who participated in preparing the journal uh, special edition for making that contribution to long term thinking and important lessons to be learned from Afghanistan, hopefully lessons that will shape the future. Thank you also to the audience for your questions and your participation, and I very much encourage you to participate in other LSE public events and continue to read the LSE Public Policy Journal. Good night. Thank you. Good night.